So the, the overarching context for pretty much all of our Arctic discussions is the, uh, the changing Arctic environment because of climate change. So it's only right uh, today, as in all of these Arctic conferences, that we get the sort of lowdown on that. I'm delighted that we'll have Professor Jason Box from the uh, Danish uh, Geological Survey to do that. He's spent 20 years studying the Arctic environment, quite often from the top of the Greenland ice sheet. Jason. Thank you. So as an Arctic climatologist, um, my presentation will paint a review. Uh, much of the information you may already know about Arctic change. Uh, the story that ICE is telling is of a very sensitive amplified response. And I'll, I'll, I'll dwell on that amplification factor because that's, that's why change is so rapid in the Arctic. And it, it presents a, a reminder, a, a warning to us. Um, this study of Greenland that's uh, gone on for me for 20 years and, and the physical climatology uh, has brought me to Denmark where uh, Greenland is, is quite closely connected. Uh, we're operating an observation system that's uh, focused where the melt rates are the largest and, and really observations are so important to in, inform to test models and we do that vigorously. So looking at the global map, you see uh, an overall warming pattern. But when you look more closely, you see warming is concentrated in the Arctic. Um, this is the last 10-year average, but this pattern has been evident for uh, decades. And when you average those temperature changes across latitude, what you see is, is uh, Arctic amplification. You see how the, the warming over in the Arctic is about three times the rate of tropical warming, uh, twice the rate of mid-latitude warming. Uh, that's the signature of, of global climate change is this Arctic-focused warming. And it has everything to do with this reflective shield of ice and, and snow cover on land, which during the summer you have 24 hours sunlight. As that reflective cover goes away, the ocean and the land warm up. So it it's, has fundamentally to do again with that reflectivity and that 24 hours uh, summer sunlight. Climate projections, here's two different scenarios. Uh, one, a, a carbon regulation scenario is, is, is significantly less warming than the business as usual scenario. Uh, these same models that began development in the late 60s always had an, an Arctic amplified warming because the physics of that reflectivity change is so simple. Remove a reflective cover, absorb more sunlight. Uh, the, the primitive models got that and it's, uh, of course, validated with the observations. And I've updated this uh, figure uh, from the IPCC report um, showing this abrupt um, enhancement of our natural greenhouse effect, which on geologic timescales is, is um, clearly an, an abrupt event. The rates are um, extreme. A reconstruction of Arctic summer temperatures uh, shows a, a, a gradual cooling until the industrial era when uh, industrial activity, carbon emissions primarily in, into the atmosphere, uh, produces a sharp warming uh, in the Arctic summer and, and globally. This pattern has been referred to as the hockey stick. In that same figure, when you put it in context of projections, um, we, we see we're looking at um, a catastrophic uh, change um, in terms of the, the climate. If, if either of those trajectories is such a profoundly changed Arctic that um, it, th there is no precedent for that in, in the geologic uh, record, uh, at least in, in the recent two million years. So we are already in uncharted territory, and this is like a, a rocket that's just gotten off the launch pad. And within our lifetimes, we will bear witness to uh, this story unfolding uh, rather rapidly. Um, it, the red line shows uh, observations of sea ice area. It, it depicts how sea ice is um, retreating um, at a twice the rate uh, that our best model projections show. So if you 
rewind to that model projection, it's, it's probably conservative in terms of warming because the models uh, still don't get the, the true fidelity of climate, the, the rapidity of, of sea ice loss, for example. Uh, the sea ice volume um, is likely to hit uh, effectively zero sea ice cover in, in the coming, uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, snow cover on land uh, along with this hockey stick is uh, retreating at a rate four, four times what model projections currently get. So again, the models are, are if anything, uh, underestimating uh, Arctic response to uh, human-driven uh, greenhouse gas uh, changes. Um, the vast store of, of land ice on Greenland uh, is, uh, of course, uh, an important part of the story. Um, the, I've, I've mapped the reflectivity of Greenland. This is the year 2000 summer and the year 2012 summer. And I'll go back and forth. Um, you can see with your own eyes um, the, the darkening of the Greenland ice sheet. This is, of course, also true for sea ice. It's true of snow cover on land. And it's readily mod monitored uh, from satellite observations. Um, the Greenland ice sheet is absorbing an additional two times the U.S. energy consumption in summertime. It's measured in exajoules. It's a huge number. And that preconditions the, the, the snow and ice for earlier melt onset, um, the expansion of the melt season. Uh, so um, independent uh, confirmed satellite observations show Greenland losing uh, an equivalent of almost one millimeter of, of sea level rise contribution per year. Um, Antarctica, meanwhile, may well take over um, for some reasons I'll mention later uh, from Greenland. Um, but our, our best picture for global sea level in the past 2,000 years is depicted here. You see a, 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 a modest rise in global sea level during the medieval warm period. Um, and then you see a modest decline in, in sea level during the Little Ice Age. The instrumental record is shown in that dark black line. And, and then we, we go up into the present time and, and projections of the future it, it bear the, 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 the fingerprint of that hockey stick. Uh, we bear witness to abrupt sea level rise. Um, and, and just 10 years ago, the best estimate was one third of this. And, and so just in the past 10 years, uh, science reveals a, a more sensitive response uh, than was previously in, encoded in, in models. Um, you know, key message that we really need to emphasize the observations in, and, and um, be, be um, uh, cautious about um, using climate model projections as, as policy tools. We should err on the side of caution, I, I, would, I would say. Um, wildfire in the Arctic is natural, however, uh, a shorter snow cover season and a uh, warming Arctic is um, leading to uh, an increase in tundra fire in the Arctic. Um, these are vast areas, uncontrolled burns, if you will. And I, I mapped the, um, the thermal signature of these events, which, which show that last year, 2014, was the most powerful fire season in, on record. Um, from year to year, the fires are burning in you know, Quebec or, or um, Siberia. Uh, but this is uh, the hemispheric picture. And, and uh, we, we see a, 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 actually a doubling in the fire um, power in, in just 15 years. Um, that's our satellite record. Um, we've been running a project called Dark Snow, uh, the darksnow.org, where we, we try to put hard numbers on uh, that reflectivity decline, in, in this case depicted from, from increasing wildfire. Um, but we're also trying to fingerprint industrial uh, activity uh, darkening uh, to, to test that hypothesis. Is, is uh, industrial activity, is increasing shipping in the Arctic um, or, or just conventional existing shipping is that delivering more black carbon to this highly reflective surface? Uh, it's um, 
this is a project still underway. We're, we're looking for support for this uh, activity. Um, there's multiple elements that are, um, you know, interesting to put it mildly. The, the permafrost degradation and the vast stores of carbon in the permafrost um, also um, destabilized from increased wave action on the shoreline and sea level rise um, pose a, a catastrophic risk um, that if warming triggers enough uh, carbon release from uh, the terrestrial um, environment, um, our, F our policy efforts to manage climate change may become uh, mute. Uh, we may lose, uh, we're on a trajectory of losing control if enough um, warming triggered carbon makes it into the atmosphere. Uh, that gives us a limited time to act. Um, surprises uh, are, you know, are around each corner. I, I think, uh, in my experience, um, the scientific community keeps getting surprised. An example here recently, explosive uh, crater um, ejections in Siberian tundra. Uh, Siberia has been warming rapidly. I spoke with a Russian scientist who who suggests, well, this is a multi-decade process. A, a heat wave has been slowly propagating down to the depth where this, these explosive events have been occurring. That's a, a, a long-term process. But the, the, the warming in Siberia is, is such that permafrost is degrading, and, and we see some surprising dramatic events like this that we don't fully understand. And it's good that um, field scientists are, are, are tackling this uh, as we speak. Uh, I want to touch on ocean heat content increase because we, you know, being land-dwelling um, animals, we, we think about air temperature, but really climate change is, is best uh, sensed in ocean heat content. Um, this uh, shows uh, from hydrographic surveys over decades uh, an enormous uh, increase in, in simply the heat in the oceans. And, and this is why we, won't, we should not expect cooling to somehow um, be a surprise um, because the oceans are taking on so much heat. Um, something like a factor of nine times more energy than the, the, the atmosphere is, is taking up. Uh, so climate change is really a story of ocean heating. Um, ocean acidification is yet another uh, story I, I'm not talking about. But in the context of ocean heating, um, we're now starting to observe um, a process we don't know how unnatural it is. How much of the ocean warming is triggering a, an increase in Arctic and global seafloor methane release? Uh, we know that, that it's natural for the seabed to, to outgas. Uh, what we still don't have a handle on is, is uh, eruptions of methane from the Arctic Ocean bed, um, like the, the, the land. Um, there, there are wisps of, of measurements that, that show very high methane concentrations but uh, in the atmosphere and observing stations like at Tixi. Um, but that methane quickly um, d dissolves in the atmosphere, so it's, it's um, a sh relatively short-lived thing. But we um, hydrographic measurements show uh, methane eruptions that uh, the risk factor that that poses if ocean heating is, is really uh, destabilizing the Arctic seafloor uh, in this way, uh, you know, our time is, it's very clear that we need to um, stop adding uh, carbon to the atmosphere, enhancing the greenhouse effect. Um, the, the final uh, points I'd like to make are just um, about model projections and, and how um, despite the, the terrific effort from many of our smartest atmospheric physicists, the models still lack m several fundamental um, processes, um, and I'd like to highlight these. Uh, for one, uh, persistent atmospheric circulation anomalies. Uh, today's global climate models do not reproduce what we're observing right now, the California, western, uh, uh, eastern U.S., that uh, record warm and dry in California, record colds in, in the eastern U.S. The climate models don't resolve very steep um, jet streams and lingering lazy jet streams. Uh, and, and this is a signature of, of climate change. Uh, this produces drought. Uh, the, Ru the Russian uh, fires of 2010, uh, this, this um, impacts uh, you know, grain production. Um, 
and, and uh, this is uh, perhaps the most immediate uh, effect of, of abrupt climate change is uh, um, persistent um, strange weather patterns. Um, the climate models do not, uh, practically all of them, do not include um, the effect of increasing fire darkening the cryosphere. That feedback process is not in the models, and therefore I would argue that that those climate, those temperature projections are probably underestimates. Um, uh, the models, climate models, global climate models used for projections do not include methane release from the ocean or the land. Um, there's a couple of them, it's just emerging, but that, that physics simply isn't encoded in the models yet. And um, when you make an inventory of amplifiers and dampers in the climate system, unfortunately, there's not an equal number of dampers that would come to our rescue because we, I've presented some strong amplifiers. Um, the inventory is something like four or five to one on the amplifier, um, and that's how the climate system comes more rapidly out of uh, glacial periods, and, and it's, it's a slow process going into a glacial period. Um, so my final slide is, is um, you know, makes this point of, of that climate change and ocean acidification are um, symptoms, they're, 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 ec they're symptoms of uh, an economic system that externalizes its environmental impacts. Um, and and it's, it's um, encouraging to hear signals coming from industry um, that we need to internalize, we need to price carbon and, and internalize um, that so that we can bring our impacts from one and a half planets down below one. Thank you. Um, we are we are close to um, out of time, so we'll we'll probably keep this fairly snappy. Um, I thought that was a terrific, accomplished tour d'horizon. Thank you very much indeed. Do we have questions from the audience? So I know we have one that's come in on our live stream from a Richard Stowe, an environmental scientist. He has two questions for you. One. Um, because the greenhouse gas potency of leaking methane is so intense, there is, and I think this is a question really, an environmental case for exploiting, I suppose he means producing, leaking gas wells in the Arctic. Um, this is an, an immediate need and opportunity. The same case applies to gas leaks from permafrost. <laughs> there needs, he says, to be a UN statute to support and demand remedial action for leaking gas wells. Do you agree with that? Uh, and... Uh, Secondly, he asks, is there a need and demand for satellite remote sensing, possibly all-weather radar remote sensing for gas and oil leaks in the Arctic? Potentially sub-ice sensing by radar. Are, these interests to, are there interests, and I think this is really a question for the audience too, is there any interest um, in having some partner development of this remote sensing? Uh, he, Dr. Richard Stowe, has the expertise, he says. Fortunately, the European Space Agency has a mission um, targeted or that with the capability of monitoring atmospheric methane. It doesn't have very high resolution near the surface, but um, it's, it's a, a, an effective tool um, that we have. We, we have observing systems um, in place. Um, uh, I think the science is, has been quite clear um, on uh, leaking um, pipes in, in gas um, production. I've, you know, I've heard that that, and, and even at this conference, that uh, the industry is, is uh, aware of that issue. And if, if leaks can be sealed, then um, then they could then we're at that point that indeed gas has a lower carbon intensity. Um, but if the leaks are not sealed, then it, it's it's a bit misleading to say that that gas um, is is you know half the intensity of of um, coal if. Uh, in that fraction, it's not accounted the, the, the leaks, which I understand are very difficult to contain. Thank you very much indeed, Thanks. Jason. That was terrific. Thank you. Jason. <laughs> okay, so uh, plenty of environmental risk. We heard a little bit earlier about some of the financial risk um, that companies, investors need to consider before going into the Arctic, and I think we're going to hear something of political risk um, shortly after lunch. Well,